The Dice Tower, Episode 645, Dream Duo. The Dice Tower is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. Welcome to The Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. In today's show, Mandy and I will talk about a couple of fun games that we've been playing. We'll cover a few apps, and then we get to talk about our designer-illustrator dream pairings in Victory Points. I'm Suzanne Sheldon. And I'm Mandy Hutchinson. And today is, we are cramming this in, Mandy, today. (laughs) (laughs) Schedules are tough. It's so hard. Well, especially now we've got time difference and I now have a very early schedule at work. So, you know, I have to be in bed by a certain hour or turn into a pumpkin. <laughs> I no comment. I was going to say something so snarky, but I'm 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 withholding. I'm, oh, I'm, fair, I'm fair maintaining enough. self-control here. <laughs> And yeah, I am actually squeezing this recording in between time at my local game convention that I help run up here in the Seattle, Washington area called Game On Con. It's a very small local convention, 150-ish people. So it's very, very small. But I love it. It's so much fun. And again, we've talked about this before in multiple episodes. But if you are interested in trying a game convention, but it's difficult for any number of reasons, to get to one of these big conventions that you hear a lot of different people talk about, check out what you have on your local scene. In fact, I met somebody yesterday and I asked them, well, hey, how did you find this convention? And they said they went to one, had a great time, and just searched on Board Game Geek. They were looking for other local conventions that they could go to and ours popped up. So be aware that they do have lists of local conventions on Board Game Geek that you can check out if you're interested in going to a convention. And oftentimes, the local ones, a little bit smaller, they might not have all the big whiz-bang sales and all that other stuff, but they usually have games and people who want to play games. And honestly, that's the best part. Absolutely. I mean, playing games, duh, no brainer. You have to check it out. (laughs) And then Mandy, we are coming up on another Aptastic. Yes, and I feel like I have to, you know, start limbering up because I'm I'm trailing badly here. Oof, it's rough. Well, I won't mention the record between the two of us right now. Oh. I'm winning. Uh, but <laughs> we are coming up on February 12th. What game are we going to be playing, Mandy? We will be playing Shards of Infinity. Yeah, this is a great deck builder and... The app is just wonderful, and I'm really looking... I don't know if we've ever played against each other, even online, before. No, I we haven't. And I have to say, I'm not very good. I'm putting it out there early, so there's no surprises if I don't win. <laughs> but I enjoy it. I still enjoy it. Thank you to everybody who joined us in our last episode with Castles of Burgundy. I had a great time playing, Mandy. I hope you had a great time playing, too. I did, even with my dismal score. But, you know, it's, it's a feld. I, of course I have fun. So don't forget to join us on February 12th. We try to give away app codes during the show. We have a wonderful group of people that gather in the chat and we talk about all sorts of things on top of the game that we're actually playing. So we hope that you can join us there. If you miss it, you can always watch the replay if you're interested in checking it out on the Dice Towers YouTube channel. All I have to say is oink, oink, moo, moo, (laughs) ba. Watch the Castles of Burgundy show. Watch Castles of Burgundy. Shockingly, that will give you context of all things. (laughs) All righty, so with that, Mandy, I'm so excited to the first game, for, oh. to hear about the first game that you've got listed here. So I want to hear about it. Let's go to it. So, what have you been playing lately? Okay, Suzanne is excited for this game. It has trains. Okay, you know what? Let's just get to it and stop fooling around. Okay, Railways of Nippon. Ooh, designer, uh, there's several here. Glenn Drover, Hisashi Hayashi, and Martin Wallace. Uh, there's no artist listed, and it's published by Eagle Griffin Games. It's uh, for two to four players, and it plays in about 90 to 120 minutes. Price-wise, it retails for about $59 Canadian. I couldn't a pin down a price in the US, but I think it's fairly close in price. 
Uh, for anybody who has not listened to the show before, uh, I grabbed these prices, the Canadian prices from Board Game Bliss online, and for the American prices, Cool Stuff Inc. also online. So let's uh, jump right in. Railways of Nippon, it's a pick up and deliver game. And uh, as the name suggests, it has to do with rails and trains. <laughs> and well, there's some other things as well. So uh, Railways of Nippon, uh, it integrates Railways of the World. So uh, I have not played Railways of the World, uh, but it does integrate aspects of that. So when you get the rule book, it actually covers parts of that game and then the new bits of Nippon. And in this game, it's a new map of Japan. And what's going to happen is you're basically trying to be uh, the railroad baron of that time. That's, that's what they say in the description. So during the game, you start with no money. That threw me for a loop. I was like, I'm sorry, what now? No money? And they have these little things called bonds that they want you to take. I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, Martin Wallace, I feel like I'm going to go in debt. So (laughs) that scared me. But uh, so when you start, you don't have any money. Bonds are something that you can take. We'll talk about those in a moment. The game, as I said before, it's a pick up and deliver game, right? So we want to make rails, tracks, lay tracks, and we want to deliver resources from one place to another. So in the game, you have options of laying tracks. You also have options of upgrading your train. So right now, for example, you start with a one, which means you can only deliver resources from one city away, so to speak. So one link away. So that's something that you can do. Um, Delivering a resource also counts as an action. There are also operational cards that you can take, and they give you kind of bonuses throughout the game. There are three... I don't, I don't want to get the wording incorrect here, but there are three <laughs> three kind of action rounds in a phase, sort of, so to speak. So the first thing you do is bid for first to see who's first player. And minimum's a thousand dollar bid. And you go around until someone, you know, everyone passes or everyone bids, and then you determine turn order that way. Whoever bids the highest goes first and then so forth. Then you go to the first kind of fa- action phase. So everybody gets to take one action, whether it's laying tracks, delivering resources, grabbing one of those operational cards, things like that. And then you do it a second time, a third time, whatever action you want to do, and you can repeat the actions that you've done previously. And then uh, we finish. After that happens, we get paid. Well, that depends. If you delivered some resources and moved up the track, then you'll get some money. Here's the tricky part. You generally end up taking bonds in the first round, and you can't just take them. If you're trying to do something and it costs money, like laying a track, you get bonds to pay for that. And if there's any left over, you get some of that money. For every bond you have, you're going to lose, kind of go back on the, sorry, you're going to lose money when you get it. So for example, if I'm getting $10 from being on the track, or sorry, 10,000 from being on the track, you know, and I had two bonds, I'll get eight instead of 10. So it subtracts what you're going to get. So the game goes like that until you have, I think in our game, it was a three-player game, so it changes on players. Once you have a certain amount of these, like, uh, I forget what they're called, empty markers. So you put them when a city's been emptied of resources, and you put that on the board. When you have, in a three-player game, for example, 12 of those out, you play one more round, and then the game ends. So it can go pretty fast. I think it took us a couple of hours to play. So with rules explanation and play, um, it went fairly quickly. Something also I forgot to mention, you have main railways, so getting from one city to another, laying your tracks, your own tracks from one city to another, can also get you some some good points and move you up on that money track. All that being said, this game, I loved it. I, oh, yay! I really, and you know, I do like kind of rail games, I just, I just never know which ones should I try. So my friends are like, glad that I started with that one because they thought Age of Steam. They're like, I don't know. It's kind of mean. They didn't think I would like it. Have you played Age of Steam? Yes. You have. Okay. So I think it's a game you can get kicked out of, right? I don't remember, actually. I think so. I think I remember watching it game night and someone was kind of hanging out because they got the boot. So they said this game is not as complicated as uh, Age of Steam. It's a bit more streamlined. Uh, It actually reminded me of um, Steve Roller's. But, okay, but with yeah, a little yeah, bit yeah, more, yeah, like absolutely. the concept was very similar. There are no dice in this game, but the concept of the delivering and creating your, you know, your tracks, that, that seemed very similar to me as in that game. I personally really enjoyed it. It's a medium kind of medium weight, lighter medium weight game. I know a lot of people are like, I don't know, I don't want to say Ticket to Ride because it's a train game, but if you're looking for something a little bit like more than that, this would be a nice place to start. 
I really liked it with three and four players because it really added some competitiveness to it. I have not played it with two. I don't know how well it would play with two. That would be interesting to see. Um, I'm looking forward to trying Railways of Portugal, which is another map. Uh, this is one I'm patiently waiting for to come from uh, from uh, the States, so that's coming soon. Um, and like I said before, I was really surprised at the whole starting with no money, but I have to tell you, I literally had two bonds the entire game. Okay. So it is doable, and two bonds is not that big of a deal. I think the most anybody had was maybe four bonds in the entire game that they took out, so... I don't think that that's bad at all. So overall, streamlined kind of rail game, plays in a short-ish amount of time compared to maybe some of the others like Age of Steam and so forth. Uh, I think you can add complexity depending on some of the expansions or maps that you play with. Uh, Some of them are a bit bigger, but this one in particular is a nice place to start, especially if you were like, oh, I kind of liked what, you know, Ticket to Ride was doing, even though it's not the same game, but it has that kind of rail building this is a nice place to kind of jump into before you maybe jump into like an age of steam or something to that effect. That's it. So Railways in Nippon, love, 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 love. I've played it several times and I can't wait to try more maps. That's awesome. I would, yeah, I really want to play it too. It's so Thanks. good. Thanks for that, man. <laughs> no <Thanks>. problem. <laughs> I don't know. Has it been a while since we've talked about a Roland Wright? I, I can't it, keep track anymore. Actually, no, but. I think it is, a, has been a while. I think it's time that we we revisit Roland Wrights, don't you? Yes, agreed. Awesome. <laughs> One of the games I picked up at Essen was Nakmal Sogut. I still haven't played mine. Oh, this is oh. going to be okay. I got to hear this. At least you have it, because yeah. I don't have Railways in Nepal. Oh, so at least that's you have fair. this one, if you like it, if it sounds interesting. <laughs> Now, Nakmal Sogut is the sibling game to a roll and write game called Nakmal that we've talked about on the podcast, and it's a nice, it's a it's a nice roll and write game for sure. This is designed by Inca and Marcus Brand, and honestly, the brands are phenomenal game designers. They are the brains behind the Exit series of games. They designed Rajas of the Ganges. They have a very diverse slate of games underneath their belt, and it's great that they do roll and writes as well. The art and graphic design is by Leon Schiffer, and the publisher is Schmidt Spiel. I picked this up at Essen. I don't remember how much I paid. These games typically go for around 10 or 15 euro. In the U.S., I expect it will go around $20, but it's not currently available. But I'm mm. assuming because Knock Mall and Dizzle and all these other great Roland Wrights in that Schmidt line have come over to North America, I'm assuming Knock Mall So Good will make its way over eventually as well. Now, Knock Mall So Good is very clearly founded in Nakmal. And as a quick refresher, in Nakmal, basically you get a sheet and it's got a grid full of different colored squares and in little clusters spread all around. And you roll these special dice and you pick a color and you pick a number. And then you cross off squares based on that pairing. So if I roll a five red, if I pick a five red, I should say, then you're going to cross off five red squares in a little bundle and ultimately use score points for completed columns and completed color groupings. That's a very high-level overview. What Nakmal so good adds is, well, a bunch of stuff. (laughs) Previously, you just scored based on finishing all the squares of a given color or for every column. Now... In So Good, you get row scoring as well. Mm. They've added another thing that you can potentially score on the columns. And the biggest addition is really a new special die. Now, each column has a heart. Mm. And you can roll your dice. And if the special die has a heart, that's one of the dice that you can take instead of a number color pairing. And you mark off a heart. And then every time you complete a column, you will score additional points based on how many hearts you've collected. There are color block bonuses on this die. There is a really great one called the bomb. And it's just, you can mark off a two by two square anywhere on the board. Because normally you have to cross off adjacent to a square you've already marked, which can be tough. But now if you get the bomb, you can place a two by two square anywhere on the board, which is Convenient on a number of levels, especially because then when you have to follow adjacency rules and turns after that, you can go off of the bomb square too. Right. So that one's awesome. There's one that lets you do squares in a given row and you can kind of skip over spaces. There's one that lets you do all the squares in a color block. And it it just adds a lot more options. Mm -hmm. And then you have rows. So now you can also score points for rows, but rows will also give you 
bonuses. Like you can get a bomb if you complete a row or you can get a heart if you complete a row, that kind of thing. So it gives you something else to work for. Overall, Nakam also good adds complexity. You have to earn those special dice. You get to start with one, but there's places on the board that you can cross off. And when you cross off one that has the little special die on icon on it, then you've earned another one that you could use to draft one. So you have to work for it. But the added complexity actually makes the game a lot more interesting to me. And interestingly, it actually shortens the game. My one complaint about Knock Maw was that sometimes it could feel like it took a long time to complete the game. Mm. And Knock Maw so good with all the extra things that you're keeping track of and all the extra things that give you possibilities, it actually shortens the game. Oh, you're working faster because some of those extra abilities can kind of tighten it up and give you a few more options, which is really, really great. So if you like Knock Maul and you don't mind adding a little complexity, definitely check out Knock Maul So Good. If you haven't played Knock Maul and you don't mind a little complexity, try Knock Maul So Good first. I definitely right now prefer it over basic Knock Maul. I've introduced it to a bunch of people. And even with the added complexity, the teach is still pretty quick. And even people who hadn't played Knock Maul before, it really clicked with them and they really enjoyed it. So I think Knock Maul So Good is a wonderful evolution on Knock Maul. It's a winner for me. I literally have it at the little convention I'm at in between right now. It's sitting on the play table because I want more people to experience it. And that's Knock Maul So Good. Yeah, I found Knock Maul, the original one, long. Like, it, I still enjoyed it, but I think it would take yeah. like 45 minutes to play at the end of the day. Or, it can, it, it yeah, can, for exactly. sure. Yeah, exactly. So very curious to see how this one works out. The next game on my list is Rival Restaurants. So this is designed by Gary Alaka, Rob Chu, and John Kang. Artist is Audrey Jung, and the publisher is Gap Closer Games. It plays two to six, and it plays in about 45 to 60 minutes. So this game was priced at $49 US on Kickstarter. So I think that just uh, was sent out recently. So some of the things you'll find in this game are auction bidding, set collection, and simultaneous action selection. People who know me are like, what? Mandy, tell us more. Oh, I will. Okay, so the goal of Rival Restaurant is you want to be the first restaurant to get 20 popularity points. And I swear, it says, and you will be crowned the wiener. Ah, the wiener. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, yeah. oh no, Mandy. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> oh. So I was like, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll go with this. <laughs> so, oh my! Oh. I, I I think I I think I have an ulcer from that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't make. I don't make this up. I don't make this up. <laughs> so players can earn these popularity points uh, by buying and trading ingredients, and they're basically trying to use them to cook or complete recipes. And uh, you have two types of recipes: one that's a bit more basic, and one that's a bit more advanced, which are worth more points, but they generate more garbage. <laughs> So let's jump in a little bit so I can explain all of this. So this is a game that actually can be played with an app. The app is not intrusive. It is just meant to be used as a timer uh, and to kind of keep you on track for the rounds. That's it. So just in case anyone gets a little nervous. What happens is there's a board uh, that has a different kind of shopping areas you can go to. So one place will sell your meats, one place will sell your dairy, that sort of thing. And then you have... Um, Oh, the name just gave me. They have another spot where you can go to to kind of get upgrades to your to your oven so you can cook two instead of one recipe, that sort of thing. And also to get rid of garbage that can be generated from your recipes. And uh, then they have in the areas where you can go shopping, there are cards and there are some on display. You'll see meats, you'll see tofu, you'll even see stuff that's like magic goo or something. I can't remember the technical term, but it acts as like a wild, things like that. But they are more expensive. So you start off the game with 300 big ones. Woo, you're rich. And what you need to do, you have this little wheel, and you have to choose on the wheel what store you're going to first, okay? This is the money and move. So at the start of the round, you get your income, 300 bucks, unless you have something that changes that, and then we're going to move. So that's where you take your little wheel, secretly put the location to go to, flip it down, and then one, two, three, everybody reveal, and then you put your little your little chef marker on the uh, spot that you're, uh, you're going to buy. So it's uh, either on the card of the ingredients you want to buy or on the deck because you're just going to buy from that area and it could be just off the top. Okay, so after that's done, get your timers ready because you have 60 seconds to barter and buy your stuff. So go on the timer. So this is where you can 
buy your stuff and then barter with other people. Say, hey, I'll trade you for this. Or, hey, can you buy this because you're in that location? If you're on the spot with someone, you have to kind of fight it out to see who's going to get ingredients there because you could get booted out. It goes pretty fast, but I don't. you're not overwhelmed. So you've got 60 seconds to do all of this. You also have action cards that you can use, which are not very nice. That stops the timer <laughs> and you do the mean thing to people. And then it starts all over. It starts up again, not over, up again. Once that's all done, you've done your trading, your buying, your bartering. Then we go to the cook and counter phase. So this is where you look at all your ingredients and go, hmm, I can make this recipe. And you make the recipe, you get a certain amount of points for it. It moves up your little tracker. And uh, it generates garbage. Garbage is bad. Because every time you complete a recipe and you have garbage, it negates points. So you want to get rid of garbage. Not so good. And then you draw another recipe. Something I didn't mention is the chefs each have their own kind of special ability. So I had one where if you were in the same space as me, you had to pay me money, <laughs> which I really liked. <laughs> nice. That was great. And uh, like I said, there are other upgrades you can do to, to cook more recipes at the same time, potentially have a celebrity endorse your restaurant to get you some extra money when uh, come the income phase. Uh, basically, so you play the game out like this round to round until a player reaches 20 popularity points. The game ends. Also, the restaurants you choose, you want to try and kind if you're able to get rest, uh, get recipes that is the specialty of your restaurant. So, for example, the restaurant in one of the games I played, uh, Vietnamese food was the the food that it that they specialized in. So, completing recipes with that extra gets you extra points. Twenty points, game's over, and that person wins the game. Whew. Yes, anybody who knows me knows I am generally not a big fan of. These kind of quick, fast, simultaneous action things and bartering and blah, just it's overwhelming. I have to tell you, wasn't bad here. I thought 60 seconds would be just crazy chaotic. It wasn't. Now, maybe okay. I, I was really worried and I was like, oh, I'm going to run out of time, you know, freeze on the spot. No, I actually had time left over when it was said and done. So I was like, oh, this is comfortable. I liked this. The game itself was easy to learn. So what I just explained to you, you could play the game. Like, it's not a hard game to learn. Sit down with... A lot of players and do it. And, and that's the thing. It plays up to six people. So I think I've played it at three and five, and it played well at both. Three, there's not as much of that barter interaction versus five. You're bound to end up on someone's space. So you definitely get that interaction. I didn't find that too aggressive, but again, it could have just been the people that I was playing with. But um, I thought that worked well. So no one got angry. You get, you know, maybe you didn't get the thing of your dreams, but, you know, you had a fun time trying to do it. I thought that wasn't too bad. Replay value on this is high because you have lots of player abilities, recipe combinations, action cards. Like there are a lot of things that will change it up from game to game, different restaurants. Definitely a lot of time. You can play this a lot of, a lot of times and you won't feel like, oh, I've seen this before. Different take on it. If people like simultaneous gameplay, you'll probably like this. It's not super stressful. I mean, unless you like the stress. <laughs> so I thought it mm -hmm. was good. Plays, a lot of people, easy to learn, plays quickly. So Rival Restaurants, while it's one that I enjoyed, it's probably not something that I would play often just because I'm not a big fan of simultaneous action timed games. But right. what I did play, I did enjoy. And if you do like those types of games, I think you will enjoy that. Awesome. I really, it's such a silly thing, but I really like that simultaneous action selection mechanism. I, I think it's really fun. For example, like in uh, uh, Grim Forest, mm -hmm. right? When you pick which location you're going to go to. And if you're the only one that goes there, you get all the benefits and that kind of thing. Right. And that alone here where you're kind of picking where you want to go sounds super fun. So I'm excited to try this one uh, in spite of that god awful winner pun oh, joke yeah oh we can just goodness. overlook that <laughs> i think to wrap up here i just have one of my lupin games if you've been <laughs> following along i've been covering these little box games from this spanish publisher called lupin games just because i've kind of been enchanted by them as a series of games and i want to share the love so to speak this one is 1911 Amundsen versus Scott. Mm. As a reminder, Lupin Games has a series of 19xx games. And, you know, the 19xx is the year and then some events. So I previously covered, I think, 1986 or 1989, 1986 Channel Tunnel, which was about developing the channel. 1911 Amundsen versus Scott is about 
a race to the South Pole. Mm. And so, again, it's very much grounded in history, like all of the 19xx games are. So thematically, they're grounded in real history, real events. And I think in general, they do a good job of capturing that history in the game. Amundsen vs. Scott is designed by Parapau Listesella. The art is by Pedro Soto. And I picked this up for around 22 euro. Looping Games did a Kickstarter where they offered their games to people in North America. And that's how I picked it up in a bundle. Now, this one is a two-player race game where you're racing to the South Pole. And basically, you have a little board that lays out. And it kind of looks like an illustration of a mountain. And then there are two paths going up the side of the board. And one path is for Amundsen and one path is for the Scott player. So you're each have your own individual path that you're going up and it looks like there's little colored dots alternating as you go. Red, yellow, blue, green, blue, yellow, whatever. And that's the path you have to do. Then there's this whole deck of cards and they have a symbol on them. There's a card type, like it could be a crevasse card or it could be a dog card or a horse card and then they come in the matching colors. And basically you're going to play those cards to march up the path. So if you are in a spot and the next spot up the mountain is yellow, then you want to play a yellow card to progress to that spot. If you want to go one beyond that, let's say the next spot is blue, you can play two blue cards to progress to that one. And then you march up. You win the game typically by getting to the very tippy top of the south of the map, which is the South Pole, and you play one of each of the four colors out of your hand. You have to have one of each card in your hand and then you win the race. Now, honestly, when I describe that, even saying it to myself, that sounds exceedingly simple and kind of boring, <laughs> but it's it's got definitely got more complexity than that. So you have this deck of cards and there's a little market that opens up and on your, on your turn, you can either take cards or play cards. If you take a card, you can take one of the up, face up cards for free. Or if there's a couple of cards in there that you want to get, you can discard cards from your hand to pick up multiple cards from the market. And that doesn't sound like a big deal, but it's got a very limited hand size. It's got, you have like seven cards that you can hold in your hand and then the market's pretty limited and you know what your other player needs. And so sometimes, or you know what you need. And sometimes there's a lot of tension in, oh, I really need that card, but not right now. But in a turn, I'm going to really wish I had it. And it's not going to stay there because I know they're going to take it away from me. So sometimes there's this urgency to what you draw out of the market. And then without a doubt, denial drafting is a big thing in this Ooh. game where you're looking at the card that comes up and you think, I cannot let my opponent mm. have that card no matter what. And then you're thinking, well, do I want this card in my hand or do I want to discard cards I already have so I can adjust my strategy a little bit? Because every card can be played by either player, but the cards can be more valuable to one player than the other based on what they are. So crevices may be better for Scott than for Amundsen. And one of the characters, I forget who it is, but Amundsen uses horses to help get up the mountain and Scott uses dogs. Mm -hmm. Well, Amundsen can play as a dog, but it won't help them as much. And Scott can play a horse, but it won't help that player as much. Right. So the variable value of cards, but the fact that they can be used by other players, either player, is actually a really intriguing little twist to how those cards are used. Then, fair warning, there's, this is not a nice game. <laughs> I, racing to the South Pole, it's aggressive in 1911, I'm telling you right now. Oh, no. Because there are things, some of the cards you can play against your opponent to knock them off their path. That's not nice. <laughs> but you gotta do what you gotta do to be first to the South Pole. So if you play a card, you can knock them off the path, and then that player can play cards to get back on the path. But it definitely sets them back. It's not a nice thing to do, but that's part of the core mechanism, right? Mm -hmm. As you're kind of going, advancing, knocking them back and forth. Figuring out when you have a card in your hand, do I use it to knock that player back or do I use it to progress myself up the track? These are the choices that you get to make with the, how the card play works. And I think that that is enough to make it more interesting for sure. Now, there are little expansions included. There are patrons that you can add that give you a one-time ability. There's actually a long game. So... Once you reach the top, you actually flip the boards and then you have to go back down the mountain and actually going back down is harder because the cards get more specific in what you need to do. Mm -hmm. And in general, this is a two player race game. It's going to take you maybe once you know the rules, it's going to take you maybe 30 minutes to play. So it's very quick. 
But there are interesting choices in how you do that card play and how you manage your hand. And I really like that. I I almost feel like I should put a content warning on this because people love their animals, right? Of course. And horses and dogs are cards in this game. I will tell you that 1911 has a card in it that when I first saw it, I literally stopped playing the game for a few minutes because I had to process. So heads up if you're uh, averse to animal trauma. I'll give you a second. Skip ahead 30 seconds. There's a card. And again, it's historically accurate. But you basically sack, you can sacrifice a dog. (gasps) Right? To progress. And the art on this is just heartbreaking because it's it's one of the the explorers like holding the dog and and looking very very sad and then there's a uh it's just it's very okay i'm just i'm horrified (laughs) it's not gory but it's just it implies what's going to happen and it's traumatic but they did that because uh, they had to freeze the dog so they had food on the way back down the mountain or on i keep on saying mountain but on the way back down the pool anyway i'm sorry okay i apologize (laughs) I but honestly I saw that card and I had to go, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And and process it. Cause it was That's a lot. That's a lot to take. It was a lot. <laughs> I like dogs. I have a dog. It was traumatic. Aww. But um <laughs> but it again, it was historically accurate. Right, right. Uh but yeah, yikes. <laughs> Overall, 1911, Amudsen versus Scott. First of all, this is a 1911 game. So it's almost a decade old at this point, which I think is interesting. I think it holds up. It's an interesting two-player race game in 30 minutes that does some interesting things with card play. It's not my favorite in the 19XX line. That would be the Channel Tunnel two-player game. It's a phenomenal game that I've already talked about in the podcast. But 1911 Amundsen versus Scott, if you get a chance to pick it up or you get one of these bundles with the other 19XX games, it's a solid two-player race game with some interesting card play. And I can definitely recommend it. Uh, as long as you aren't too attached to your dog. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, let's move on to maybe something a little more happy with fewer animals involved, perhaps. And now let's look at the digital side of board game with Tap That App. All right. Well, I've been feeling kind of happy, happy, happy. Okay, that was, I don't know where I was going with that. But I have an app that goes way back or a little back. Carcassonne. Yeah. (laughs) It's a classic for a reason. Exactly. It's, it's. Very good. So uh, I'm going to be talking about Carcassonne, as I said before. The Coding Monkeys did this one on iOS, and Asmodee Digital did this one on Android, from what I gathered online. Yep. Uh, it runs for s- about six ninety nine dollars uh, f- on both of those platforms, uh, but about $10-ish, depending on sales, on Steam and Nintendo Switch. So it's available on all of those platforms. And I will say that it was one of the it doesn't happen too often. The Quicks app is another example of this mm. where different developers got the license for iOS versus Android. So the okay. Coding Monkeys originally launched it on iOS years and years ago. And then mm-hmm. uh, Asmodee Digital came out with a different version for Android and Steam and Nintendo Switch. Oh. Now, the license for Coding Monkeys has expired. And so Asmodee Digital will in the future be the official publisher for the app on iOS as well. So Asmodee Digital will own all of the Carcassonne app on all platforms. Now, there's some controversy over this because a lot of people love the Coding Monkeys edition on iOS. And it's Mm -hmm. been played as a beloved board game app for years. Right. But things happen, times change, all this other stuff now you'll have that consolidated system and graphic interface and all that other stuff uh, in the relatively near future for iOS. So just a heads up on that. If you already have the iOS edition, it's going to change. Okay. No, I didn't know that. So that's also something new for me. So that's great. So uh, I'll give a little background for those who have not played Carcassonne or are not familiar with it. It's a tile placement games where players are going to draw tiles and then place them in kind of like a landscape area. The tiles might have cities, a road, a cloister, a grassland, or 
combination of those things. And it has to be placed adjacent to tiles that have already been played. So you basically want to try and connect cities to cities, roads to roads. And once you've placed a tile, you can maybe put a meeple on certain areas. And depending on where you place it, like in a, a city, it's a knight, road, it's a robber, cloister, it's a monk, grass, it's a farmer. And then when that area is complete, that meeple scores points for that owner. Um, I am actually terrible at this game. Doesn't matter how many times I play it. And I think I'm being strategic. Terrible. I lose all the time against easy AI. It's just, it's a travesty. No, it's, so, <laughs> it's just bad. But I still love it. I, Carcassonne's a great game great on digital. I'm talking here, I've played it on iOS, so I have it on my iPad, and I've played it on the Nintendo Switch. They are different. So let me start by saying, (laughs) on the Nintendo Switch, I found it hard to find things. Do you know what I mean? Mm, Like if I was trying to... Well, and what you're experiencing is your iPad version is Coding Monkeys, and the Switch is Asmodee Digital. So you can, so just FYI, you can see the differences. So I'm going to start off by saying right off the bat, if you can get the iOS version, get that version. I'm oh, not crazy so interesting, Mandy. about the Nintendo Switch. So the Nintendo Switch, it's fine, but I'm not like, oh, you need to have it. I just found there were a few things that drove me crazy. So just trying to find things mm-hmm. in the app, I was like, oh, and then you have to use, you can't just use one joystick. Some that requires like two different different things will require a different joystick or a different button, which I found ridiculous. I don't understand why I can't just be one joystick to use for that. The interface of it is the board is nice. The scoring kind of way that's set up is nice, but it's still fairly basic. I don't think you can title like put your name in the Nintendo Switch. It's like player one, player two. Oh, interesting. So if I'm remembering correctly, and in iOS, I think you can if I'm not mistaken. Um, So just little quirks like that uh sometimes it's sluggish on the nintendo switch so it's like okay why is it taking a while to get moving here versus uh, the ios i did find a bit quicker on the draw so that was i found that better um you can play locally with friends or against ai but i don't think you can play online with the switch for carcassonne if i'm not mistaken I haven't tried it at all, but I don't think it's an option. Overall, all that to say is I prefer the iOS version. Hmm. The Nintendo Switch version, I have it. I paid for it. It was on sale. So I was like, why not? Let's give it a try. It's fine. So, I I mean, if you have nothing and you only have a Nintendo Switch, okay. But if you do have a choice, I would probably say I do like the way the iOS version plays better. So, Carcassonne. Wow, that is so interesting, Mandy, right? to me, I, that you like, and that is exactly why there's a little bit of controversy about the Coding Monkeys edition going away. Huh. Uh, I didn't know that. So yeah, that ties in exactly with what I was And see, saying. I've always played it on iOS, and I've only had peaks at the Asmodee Digital Edition, so I haven't really interacted with it to suss out some of the challenges that you've mentioned. So mm-hmm. hmm, interesting. Well, I wanted to turn to a very recently released board game app, On Tour. On Tour is a roll and write game published by Board Game Tables. Board Game Tables decided to get into (laughs) board game publishing, which, great, because they did On Tour and then they did QE, which you may have heard people talking Mm -hmm. about, which is a really fascinating kind of auction game where you can bid any amount you want to, literally <laughs> a gabillion dollars yeah. kind of thing. But On Tour is a roll and write game. And basically, you get a map of the United States with little circles traversing it and lines connecting those different circles. And you roll two D10s. And the two numbers that show up, you use twice. Because what happens is if you roll a three and a seven, You're going to write 37 in a space, and you're going to write 73 in a space. There are cards that indicate regions that you can write that in. So you're going to have a selection of cards, a limited selection of cards, and then you'll roll these dice, and then you write those two numbers in one of those relative regions. You get bonus points if you write it in a specific state as indicated on the card, that kind of thing. And you go through this, you keep on going, keep on going until your board's all filled up. And ultimately, your goal is to have the longest possible tour path that links numbers in ascending order. They don't have to be sequential, like one, two, three, but one, seven, eight, 
22, 24, 35, that kind of thing. The longest chain of ascending numbers throughout this map of the United States using the numbers that you wrote in through that dice play. It's a really solid roll and write game that I enjoy a lot. And I think we've reviewed it here on the podcast. Well, one of their things that they did in the Kickstarter for On Tour is that they said that if they reached a certain amount, they would create an app. Well, guess what? They created the app. This is available on iOS and Android. It is $3.99. And it is very true to the Roll and Write game. And I have always said that Roll and Write games would make great board game apps because of the simplicity of components and layout and things like that. And it holds true very much here. It is a fairly simple app. It's only for solo play. It goes through all the setup, though. The dice roll automatically. You tap on it, it lets you, you tap on a circle and it lets you pick which number you want to put in there. So it's pretty easy to use in that regard. It does all the math for you at the end of the game, which is nice. You don't have to count your path. The, the app calculates it for you. So that's really nice as well. There's a quote unquote tutorial that really is just a, it, it's as in depth as the description I just gave the game. It's just maybe five screens that walk you through the basic mechanisms of the game. Mm -hmm. It's enough, like, if you didn't know how to play on tour, you would get the gist of the game from playing this quote-unquote tutorial, but it's just a slideshow of highlights of the rules kind of thing. Overall, on tour, if you want a solo distraction, if you like on tour and wanted it on the go as kind of a solo challenge, or if you aren't sure about on tour and you wanted to try something to see if you'd enjoy it, because I've actually seen people who got the on tour app online and played it and then they go, I'm ordering the game. I love this game. I'm ordering the real game now that I've played it in the app form. And I think that's one of the cool things about apps in general. I wish that the rules, the full rule book was in there that you could scroll through just so you really understand all the finer details of the game. It is what it is. It's a very simple game. Um, part of me wishes it was just a little bit more sophisticated. But then the other part of me is it does what it wants to do very cleanly, very simply. And maybe you can't ask for much more. But personally, I really do enjoy it. It plays quickly. It plays smoothly. No fuss, no muss on the math. So On Tour is a solid board game app available on iOS and Android. On Tour is one I know that you reviewed the board game. And I ended up getting a copy myself. And I quite enjoyed it. I like the the quality of the game is really good. So I'm really excited to see this uh, on an app. Do you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. just carrying the game around, it is in a slightly, not large, but larger box. And if I can just play it quickly on my phone or, you know, something like that, that's great. Absolutely. It's, it is awesome for on-the-go gaming. We asked. You answered. It's time to discuss hot topics in Victory Points. while since we've had a regular victory points segment but we got a poll up on the dice towers bgg group and it was a lot of fun to see people's responses for this episode we asked you who is your designer illustrator dream team for a game so if you had any designer game designer out there and any illustrator out there that teamed up to make a game that you would be banging on the store door to go and buy, who would it be? And it was a lot of fun to see the answers. Let's see what you all said. And Mandy, then I want to know what your dream team is. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. And let me guess what the designer is. But anyway. <laughs> Bill Grant says Stefan Feld and Ian O'Toole. Yes, please. Joe Punman says the Lacerda O'Toole dynamic is pretty solid, but to think of some combos that haven't happened yet. How about Feld and Lockett. I'd love Ooh. to see those cool visuals from above and below and near and far on a game with Feldian mechanisms. Maybe Fister O'Toole or Fister Bosley. Really Fister and anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Enbred says, I came here to say Alexander Fister and Michael Menzel. Brown 02134 says, Eric Lang and Beth Sobel. Finally, a soothing area control game. <laughs> that would be fascinating. <laughs> C. Miller says Richard Garfield and Quan Chai Moria. Big Andy D. says Piero Lalune and David Turksey. Sam Goodlett said, I would like to see a Ryan Lockett and Jamie Stegmeier combo. I could picture a family cooperative storytelling game that plays like a legacy campaign. Wow. 
Yeah, that sounds intense. Uh, Molluskscape says, I love Ryan Lockett's art and world building, but this game, but his games always feel to me like they end right as they start to get really interesting. I'd love to see a theme heavy designer like Mike Elliott or Eric Lang do something with his IP and art. War Gas Eagle says Simone Luciani and Ryan Lockett. Interesting. And finally, Thesp says, I would love to play anything designed by Tom Lehman and illustrated by Marie Cardois. Cardois' lovely and playful illustrations would mask a well-considered mechanic lying beneath the surface that I would grab as soon as it hit the market. Thank you, everybody who chimed in on the Board Game Geek thread. We can't read every reply, but if you have a chance to go back into the guild, you should. there's a lot of fun ideas in there, and I was impressed with some of the combos. I was really surprised, I have to admit, at the number of people that called out Ryan Lockett wanting Ryan Lockett to illustrate other people's designs. Now, he does that, but always under the Red Raven umbrella. Right, right. But as soon as I started reading those replies, I went, oh, I would love that. Because more Ryan Lockett (laughs) art, I am 100% behind that, no matter who the designer is. Yeah, I have to say, I, I too was surprised. Not, I mean, I love his art. I think it's fantastic. And I think just some of the combinations with Ryan Locke, and I'm like, that would be interesting because it's not something you would immediately think of. So having that kind of different twist, I think would be really fun. Well, and I, I really like that one about Eric Lang and Beth Sobel, right? Because That's Beth great. is known for those beautiful natural scapes and painterly human figures and just really s- soft lines and they're beautiful and lush. And then Eric Lang does a lot of these rawr, rawr. <laughs> <laughs> kind of games, but not always. True. That's true. And and so that would be fascinating for sure. Oh, I think that'd be really good. I'm trying to think of Richard Garfield and Quan Chai Moria. So Richard Garfield, you know, King of Tokyo. I mean, sure, Richard yeah. Garfield did this little thing called Magic the Gathering, but King of Tokyo, classic. Uh, there's also the mm, treasure one that is the drafting. Of course, I can't remember the name of it now, uh, but there's a drafting one that he came out with that is hugely underrated as far as I'm concerned oh, okay. and underappreciated. So honestly, you put Richard Garfield on any game and I'm going to be interested in it because that guy can design and then put Quan Chai on oh. anything. Well, that's it. And right? I want to take a look that's at it because Quan Chai is amazing. amazing. Sold. <laughs> so what about you? What about you? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm Stefan Feld and who, Mandy? That's what I really wanted to know. <laughs> Stefan Feld and who? Well, wait, no, you might be surprised. I feel like my selection is going to be, what's that movie? Was it called New Year's Eve or New Year's Day or something like that? There was a movie where it had like a ton of celebrities in it. Oh, sure. One of those kind of movies. It'd be like that. So, of course, Feld. Yes, come on. That's a given. I have like a, 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 com- like a combination here. So, Feld... Alexander, so Stefan Feld, Alexander Fister, Vital Lacerda. Bam. That's a design team. You all are going to do something fantastic. Oh, now we're mixing designers? Don't cheat the system. We can do not... the design dream team later. They're, they're still in the, the realm. So I'm going to go with that. And then for artists, oh, this is so hard. I actually would kind of go left field and say Quan Chai. Just because it is not the type of art that you would think you would see. Now, don't get me wrong. He can do all types of art. That's not what I'm saying. But when you think of his stuff, it's like a lot of color and it's bold, you know? So I would be very interested to see what he would come up with, with those designers and his art. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. And honestly, I because I'm so used to Ryan Lockett doing Red Raven games, mm-hmm. it never would have entered my consciousness to pair him with any other game designer as a pure artist. It's but true. after I started, I can't stop thinking about it. I'm like, oh my gosh, Ryan's art, Ryan's art. So one of my favorite game designers is Uva Rosenberg. Mm-hmm. And so, of course, I'm interested in that. But I love what Quan Chai can do with bold colors and bold style. And yes. that's something that you don't always get to see in kind of – heavier Euro style games, which exactly. is of course maybe the kind of game that you and I often gravitate towards. Right. I think that's partly why people really love the Lacerda O'Toole combination. Yes, absolutely. Because there's Vital doing these incredibly dense, heavier games. And then there's Ian putting beautiful, thoughtful graphic design and illustration to them. And that pairing is magical because you have 
I think a a mechanism grouping that you don't often in the industry associate with very beautiful illustration. It tends to be or modern styles of illustration. Right. They tend to you can definitely get like beautiful, more classic style illustration in euros all the time. But I think what this really says when I'm really looking at this list is people want different. Mm -hmm. Exactly. People are used to euros with classic paintings. And mm -hmm. perhaps this even goes to setting a little bit. People are used to euros about trading in the Mediterranean and that old joke. But I think there's this hunger for something that takes a, a sidestep. I think the Eric Lang Beth Sobel combination is another perfect example of oh, that. Where yeah. I think publishers, if any publishers are out here listening to this, I think that this is maybe something to think a little bit more about. Mm -hmm. What fascinating illustrator could you pair with that game that maybe is a little unexpected? That's it. And exactly. maybe you give that illustrator a chance to bring a different life and a different energy to the game project that you've got designed. Because I think people love that. Absolutely. Like, what, what, what do you think about having like a special edition game or something like that? Or maybe you come up with a game, it's a new game, but you have kind of guest artists. Do you see what I mean? So one does one box, one does another, one does another. And then people can kind of say, I love the game, but I love the art here. Do you know what I mean? Like kind of pull in different artists from time to time to kind of potentially do the same game, but with different art. I think that's kind of cool. And some people might be, or collectors might want them all. Maybe they sell them as art pieces. I don't know. I think that would be interesting. Maybe because I worked in fashion, right? You do a lot of these kind of collections mm -hmm. in fashion or in makeup and that sort of thing. And people are like, oh, collection new, bye, bye, bye. I'm not saying that everyone has the money for that, but it's an option. I think that's an interesting approach. I think financially, it's it's just not fiscally oh, it, feasible absolutely. in a lot of cases, except in limited. You never know. I think there are different examples. So, for example, the game in North America, Pandasaurus got that and released Quan Chai Moria art on it. <laughs> and I know people flocked to grab it absolutely. because they liked that different art on it. I know Abyss tried different art covers, and there were certainly people that sought out a copy of the game that had the specific art that they mm -hmm. had. And then you also have the Century example where right. you had the, the three Century games and then they ended up releasing the Gollum edition, which they had announced and then canceled and then re-announced and then <laughs> said they weren't going to do the expansions and then backed off of that and then did the like, – it's been quite the journey for Century. But, right. but it's popular. They only continued – they only did it because there was demand. Exactly. Exactly. So it's an interesting idea. And I think you see that with Kanban or Rococo that <laughs> conveniently enough, Ian O'Toole yep. is doing the art for, <laughs> right? Where fire. these games pre already exist, but these are putting kind of a fresh coat of paint right. on the production, certainly components and things like that, but also the illustration. And I, for one, love Rococo, love and treasure my original copy. I am 100% in on the new deluxe edition with that Ian O'Toole art. Oh, I, I actually don't own Rococo, so of course I'm getting it. Now, Kanban's a different issue. Um, I have the original. I have the Stronghold version. Do I really need a third? And I'm like, yes. Yes, I do. Have to you To round out the collection. Yes, I've seen it. It's so pretty. <laughs> it's fantastic. Did you see the cards? They have like little metal I know. Cards. They have an <gasps> offering for metal. Like we've, we've graduated from metal coins, people. <laughs> to metal like, cards. We are raising the bar a little. Whoa. <laughs> metal cars. <laughs> but I think the, another example of where, Mandy, what you're talking about is the Board Game Geek Poster Artist Series. Right, exactly. Where you have different illustrators imagining the setting of a game. And that series has been hugely popular. I've got six of them hanging in my office right mm -hmm. now because I love them so much. Right. Whether it's Beth Sobel's Castles of Burgundy or Quan Chai Moria's Galaxy Trucker, that kind of thing. I think Ian O'Toole did Race for the Galaxy that's res Anyway, um, <laughs> right? There is this hunger, I think, for artists that are really valued to get their chance at different games that maybe we aren't used to seeing them do. And and I think that with modern gaming, as game settings become more diverse and interesting and varied, allowing more dynamic combos of game designer and illustrator would be super duper fun. 
Yeah, so I, I mean, I hope people are listening, you know, publishers, and maybe this is a cool idea. And some of these have stirred some ideas, you know, to happen, because I think there's some really cool pairings here. So crossing fingers, exciting stuff. Well, I know I got inspired by all of the Ryan Lockett names. So there are definitely combos that I hadn't thought of, like Pierre Laloon and David Tersey. I mean, yeah. that's oh, amazing, That'd be right? great. So, hey, if you missed jumping in on the thread before this recording, I encourage you to jump into the thread now because I want to continue to be inspired. And, you know, you never know who's reading. You never know. The publishers are all over Board Game Geek and the publishers are aware of Dice Tower. So you never know what decision maker might be scoping out that thread and get inspired by a nice suggestion that you make. So keep on dropping your dream team pairings for designer and illustrator into the Board Game Geek thread about this Victory Points because I think if nothing else, it'll be super fun to read. And Mandy, maybe in the future, we'll do a designer pairing. I know. I just had to throw it out there. Just in case, uh, it could happen. It would be so awesome. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, thank you, everybody, so much for your input on your dream team for a game. We appreciate that. It's always fun to do victory points. I think next episode will be due on a Q&A. So you can always email your questions about games or conventions or pie to me at Suzanne at Dicetower.com. And, well, I'll answer anything, really. And you can send it to Mandy, that's Mandy with an I, at Dicetower.com. Thank you, everyone, for your listenership and your friendship and for being here and being part of the Dice Tower family. Thank you so much for helping the 2020 Kickstarter be a resounding success for the Dice Tower. Absolutely, our deepest gratitude for your support there. It means so much, and we're so happy that you see what we do is valuable and can chip in where you can. And that is amazing and awesome. Next episode is 646. And Tom and Eric are going to travel back in time and revisit their favorite games from a decade ago, 2010. Mm. Until next time, I'm Suzanne Sheldon. And I'm Mandy Hutchinson. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Basil Memorial Fund is an organization dedicated to helping gamers in need. Learn more about the fund's mission and how you can help at jackbasil.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Suzanne, Mandy, and Eric, with assistance from Roy Kennedy and Rob Searing. Our theme is composed by Timothy Pinkham and arranged by Matt Bellier, and hosting is provided by Cool Stuff Inc. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at Dicetower at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. All right, it's that time again. Two truths and a lie. Let's start off with what I had to say from last episode. I've never seen any of the Star Wars movies. I'm incredibly superstitious, and I've never gotten a speeding ticket. If you said I've never seen any of the Star Wars movies was the lie, that is correct. I have seen all of the Star Wars movies. Come on. Yeah, you have. (laughs) Come on. (laughs) Last episode, I said I like cats. I like ferrets, and I like guinea pigs. Interesting, okay. And the lie is, I'm so sorry, Gil Hova, if you're out there listening, I'm so sorry. The lie is that I like ferrets. Oh, I do no. not like ferrets. Oh. I do not like them, Sam I am. Oh, dear. Well, you know, not for everyone. I will just say this, guinea pigs are rad. If you haven't, if you don't know much about, about guinea pigs, they're pretty cool. Very cute. They make little beep, beep 
No, it's very cute. <laughs> so for this week, we have a theme going, designer theme. So let's get into it. I have met Alexander Pfister. I have met Uwe Rosenberg. And I have met Hisashi Hayashi. And I just copied Mandy after I saw what she did. <laughs> so I said, I've met Michael Kiesling. I've met Uva Rosenberg. And I've met Wolfgang Kramer. Oh, there you go. So this should be interesting to see what you think. Good luck. Good luck. 